All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Miller. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences at McMaster University uh, and Canada Research Chair in Viral Pandemics. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you today to this CAR session on immune correlates of protection against SARS-CoV-2 in the context of HIV. Um, it really is a pleasure to uh, have the privilege of moderating this panel today, um, which really includes uh, an all-star cast of uh, speakers who I'll introduce you to in a moment. Um, just for context setting, the way the session will run is that each of our panelists today will provide uh, a roughly 12-minute presentation, um, which covers different aspects of uh, immunity against SARS-CoV-2, um, at which point we'll open the floor to um, questions and, and conversation. Um, so please feel free uh, at any point to input your questions into the question window. Um, I'll monitor those and then direct them to the appropriate speaker or speakers uh, at the conclusion of the session. Um, our first speaker today um, will be uh, Dr. Daryl Falzerano, who is uh, a research scientist at the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, or VEDO, at University of Saskatchewan. Um, it's, uh, it, it really is um, a pleasure to have Daryl with us today because he's one of the, I, I would say, very rare individuals who had serious deep credibility in the field of coronavirus research uh, prior to this pandemic. Um, Daryl has, has had uh, a, a really illustrious career studying high consequence pathogens. Um, in particular, he's been involved in the development of animal models for coronavirus. Uh, coronaviruses and other emerging infectious diseases, um, including the alpaca model for MERS coronavirus, um, bat models, um, marmoset models, and, and I think quite recently um, non-human primate models as well. Um, he's been one of the lead investigators as well on uh, Vito's uh, COVAC-2 vaccine, which is currently in phase two clinical trials. After uh, Dr. Falzerano, um, the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Galit Alter, who I'm sure uh, needs very little introduction to all of you in this audience. Uh, Dr. Alter is a professor of medicine at the Rune Institute uh, of uh, MGH, MIT, and Harvard, and is the co-director of the Harvard University Center for AIDS Research. Um, her research uh, has been really focused on um, the, the extremely elegant development of systems biology tools to understand correlates of immunity against infectious diseases. And uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, she's particularly well known for um, the development of her system serology platform, um, which, which has been really, um, I think, paradigm shifting in terms of the way that we think about uh, deploying assays that are capable of describing immune correlates of protection. After Dr. Alter, uh, we'll hear from Dr. Finzi, who again, I'm sure needs uh, little to no introduction to most of you. Dr. Finzi is a principal scientist at uh, CUHM at Université de Montréal um, and a Canada Research Chair in Retroviral Entry. Um, Dr. Finzi is, is certainly one of the world's leading experts in um, understanding viral glycoproteins, particularly, uh, obviously, um, in the context of HIV, the dynamics of those proteins' interactions with their cognate receptors, um, and the interactions of, of those viral glycoproteins with, with antibodies. Uh, Dr. Finzi has been just unbelievably prolific uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, and has made really uh, tremendous contributions to our understanding of um, immunity against uh, COVID-19, especially in, in Canadian cohorts. Um, after Dr. Finzi, uh, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Mubareka who again, I'm sure needs little introduction. Dr. Mubareka is an infectious diseases physician and virologist at uh, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and the University of Toronto. Um, 
uh, Sam and I have known each other for quite a long time because um, she did uh, a, a stint of training in Manhattan with my postdoctoral mentor, uh, Peter Pulezi. So uh, Dr. Mubareka um, uh, has a long history of expertise in uh, particularly respiratory infectious diseases and has made major contributions to our understanding of viral transmission, both clinically and in uh, animal models. Her group at Sunnybrook was amongst the first to isolate SARS-CoV-2 from um, the first Canadian patients um, and has played a major role in the uh, ongoing isolation of virus um, that she's very generously made available probably to, to many in this audience um, and, and certainly the Canadian uh, research community uh, more broadly. Um, Dr. Mubarek has had also many very important uh, roles on, on major uh, federal and provincial organizations, as well as um, international organizations like the WHO in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, including uh, writing guidelines regarding clinical management of, of COVID-19 um, and some really important One Health uh, work that she's done um, with the Royal Society of Canada. And finally, um, the session will be rounded out by Dr. Cecile Tremblay, who, who again, I'm sure all of you in this audience know very well. Dr. Tremblay is an infectious diseases um, clinician and medical microbiologist at Université de Montréal and is the uh, Pfizer Chair on Translational HIV Research. Um, from 2012 to 2015, Dr. Tremblay served as Director of uh, the Laboratoire de Santé Publique du Québec, um, or the Quebec Public Health Laboratory. Uh, and during this mandate, uh, she was responsible for development of a research program on HIV epidemiology in Quebec and coordination of uh, the laboratory response to biological threats and emerging infectious diseases. Um, so again, lots of experience in uh, the area that we're going to be covering today. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, please uh, uh, join me in a virtual warm welcome of our panelists today. Uh, and I will turn the floor over to Dr. Falzerano to uh, kick things off. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Dr. Miller. I just need a second here for my computer to catch up. And are we looking okay? Looks good. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much to um, for the invitation to, to speak here, especially being a non, a very non-HIV. Um, orientated uh, person. Um, I was asked to sort of give an introduction into SARS-2 and animal models, and then a little bit of, of, of work we, we do in our lab, uh, focusing on, um, uh, from the neutralizing antibody perspective is what I'm gonna do. And then of course, I'm gonna be followed by people who are gonna say that that's certainly not all there is to it. Um, and, and so you'll see that, that immunity to, to SARS-2 is, uh, is complex. And I think there's a lot, uh, a, a lot of aspects that going on there. Um, so just because it's an introduction, the we you know where we are today, you know over 500 million cases, uh, six million deaths, and so if you do some easy math there, that's a 1.2 percent case fatality rate. Um, but we've managed to vaccinate almost 12, are we almost 12 billion doses of vaccine have been delivered. And if you look what's happening over the last just 28 days, there's still 24 million cases um, in that period of time. So that's pretty bad. But if you, you look at it in terms of deaths, there's only 88,000 deaths. Uh, and, and so from an overall to the last little window, the case fatality rate is, has, has moved or decreased by, by almost 75%. Uh, and there's probably a number of reasons for that virus evolution, but I think a large part is due to that, that upper right number and the number of vaccinations delivered. Uh, offering protection, even though protection may not always be perfect. In Canada, um, you know, we're sort of at the end of what seemed like a really bad period from, you know, January to April. Uh, and, and we're in this, this sort of 
setting of cases now where, where they're going down and people are feeling more comfortable, but you can see that our level of cases, and that's with really poor case reporting, so many cases aren't reported these days anymore. Uh, we're at previous peaks where, where we used to be uh, in a not very good situation, but cases and hospitalizations uh, are no longer following the same kind of trend. So there's way more cases, but way less hospitalizations. Um, and so that's leaving us in a much better place than we were, despite the large number of cases still ongoing. Uh, and, and just on the bottom here, the update uh, for Canadian vaccine, um, the percentage of people who are classified as fully vaccinated, 81% in the total population and 89, 12 and older. And some catching up to do in that younger age grade, uh, group, the 5 to 11s, where we're only at 40%. So the virus that causes all this problem is, is SARS-CoV-2, one of the coronaviruses. Um, they've done this before, of course, SARS-1, uh, but that only caused 10,000 cases. And MERS continues to cause cases with a high case fatality rate, but only managing you know, less than 3,000 cases. So uh, SARS-2 being related, but, but highly different in how it's, it's been transmitted to the number of people that it has. Has the largest genome of our, all the RNA viruses. Has a lot of proteins. Um, both structural and, and uh, or sorry, a lot of non-structural proteins involved in replication uh, and, and host immune modulation, and not so many um, structural proteins. So really you only have your nucleoclapsid, your envelope, your membrane, and, and spike making up most of what, uh, most of the virus. And um, as we'll see in a minute, we have a number of interventions uh, to target and control SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and they're kind of directed to just a, a number, very limited number of, of targets. So we have a number of antivirals, uh, varying effectivenesses. Um, so remdesivir and molnupiravir, which target or interfere with the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, Nirmatrelivir, which is part of Paxlovid, which uh, inhibits uh, an essential protease that's necessary in the virus replication. Um, uh, necessary for virus replication, it cleaves the different um, um, proteins apart from a polyprotein. And uh, as well, we have a number of monoclonal antibodies, and these have evolved over time as the virus has evolved. So initially, there is very effective monoclonal antibodies. As new variants appeared, those became less effective or not effective, and new ones replaced them. And so that continues to evolve in the United States at the moment. Beptela Beptelomivivab is, is what is the recommendation in Omicron areas. And then you can see, depending on whether or not it's BA1 or BA2, there are different recommendations. Now this targets the spike protein. So these are all neutralizing antibodies that block spike from interacting with ACE2, its receptor, and then gaining entry into the cells. And that's largely how most of the vaccines we have are working as well. So there's a number, six different approved vaccines right now in Canada adenovirus vectored vaccines, RNA-based vaccines, uh, and subunit or VLP-based vaccines. Uh, these all contain or express the spike glycoprotein. Uh, and of course, worldwide, there's also whole inactivated vaccines that are used and those would contain all of the structural proteins. But it's largely accepted there that antibodies against spike are gonna be involved uh, in, in protection. And then how those antibodies um, act and what role they play is, is largely probably driving the extent of protection you see. Now, initially when these vaccines were rolled out, they were protecting very well against the homologous virus. So they were matching the Wuhan virus that was circulating and vaccine effectiveness was high. And that was sort of the, the what we was called vaccine effectiveness was considered no infection. And as virus has evolved, uh, so has sort of what we look at in terms of vaccine effectiveness. It has kind of moved down and I'll talk about that in a second. So you can't really talk about SARS without talking the, about the evolution of variants. So back in 2020, we started with what we call ancestral Wuhan virus. It actually only took, um, and that would be at the bottom left-hand part of this very nice graphic provided uh, by Nextrain. <clears throat> It didn't take very long before a single point mutation in spike, so a D614 to G, evolved and kind of took over worldwide from um, what the ancestral looked like. And 
Um, that really didn't increase pathogenesis, but it did increase transmissibility. And that's sort of the first, that wasn't called a variant at the time or a variant of concern, but that really was sort of the first variant that popped up and, and, and spread and showed that variants that are able to transmit better are the variants that are gonna take over. And subsequently that's what's happened in numerous different uh, waves worldwide. So you see these gray viruses, which are sort of different versions of ancestral viruses, never really breaking out and causing uh, you know, a large cluster, although some do persist for quite a long period of time. Um, but we had alpha come and break out and be more transmissible than that D614 virus. So it sort of took over for a while, became predominant again worldwide. At the same or a similar time, another variant beta also appeared, possibly a more pathogenic virus able to evade pre-existing immunity a little bit better, but probably not more transmissible. And as you can see from the very small amount of purple, uh, kind of disappeared and never really took over the way Alpha did. Everyone thought Alpha, of course, was really bad. And then came along Delta, um, which you know blew Alpha out of the water and just caused way more cases, is way more transmissible, and it took over. Um, and we all thought Delta was bad until Omicron took over. Um, you know, in, in 20, uh, at the end of 2021. And that's what you see here uh, at the top, this 21K or BA1 followed by uh, BA2 um, below. Again, more transmissible. In this case, replicates probably better in the upper respiratory tract, lesser in the lower, um, and really has been able to just drive transmission everywhere. The good thing that sort of accompanies that is it does seem to cause possibly a little bit less disease despite, um, uh, despite not matching vaccine protection as, as well as previous um, variants have. And just a different way of looking at this, this is just in the past year, looking at how alpha was trailing off here in the purple at the top left and delta took over until it was replaced by Omicron BA1 uh, and then later is now being replaced by, by BA2. And as the virus evolved, so has what vaccine efficacy has sort of looked at. Initially, you know, prevention of infection was the bar and that seemed to be the case with vaccines. Uh, and then as variants has evolved, you know, we've had to look at vaccine effect effectiveness a little bit differently. Does it prevent moderate disease or severe disease or hospitalization or death? And vaccination still seems to do that. So we still have successful vaccines, even though maybe they need to be um, looked at in terms of being updated as we, we go ahead. I think none of the small animal model, or, sorry, none of the vaccines, antivirals or uh, monoclonals would have been developed uh, without the ability to have animal models to uh, do that. So there's a number of small animal models available, Syrian hamsters, uh, mice, um, both transgenic mice expressing human ACE2, uh, as well as wild type mice that you can use adapted virus in, or some of the variants are able to replicate in those as well. The probably the most important animal models were hamsters and uh, and mice, and then accompanying with non-human primates, where a lot less disease uh, is being seen, uh, but you still have virus replication. They're the closest um, sort of thing to humans, and and so that has been used in almost all of the approvals of all available vaccines, and also for antivirals as well. There's a number of other animal models, and I see somehow I'm running out of time. Um, uh, these are non-traditional animal models, so they're kind of not really used. Uh, they may be used for transmission and pathogenesis studies, but not for um, uh, not for licensure of um, of products. And of course, SARS has been amazing in how many animals are susceptible. So lists there from large cats, dogs, otters, foxes, all kinds of wild animals uh, are susceptible to infection, although they do not necessarily get sick and in many cases they don't transmit. There's also some non-susceptible species as well as chickens, ducks, and turkeys. What virus you get infected with, um, your immune response in terms of neutralizing antibodies tends to be biased towards that virus. So this is hamsters. We find if you're challenged with alpha, you have neutralizing antibodies to the highest level against alpha. Same case with beta and much lesser to alpha or uh, an original Wuhan. So in hamsters, we saw that. We've looked at some human samples as well, where we see the same thing. If you were exposed to Wuhan, you have the best neutralizing against Wuhan. Delta against Delta, 
Uh, and then much poorer levels of neutralization against something like Omicron, a new variant popping up. You can boost that by vaccination. So infection plus two vaccinations can bring up levels against the diverge levels of neutralizing antibodies against a divergent um, variant such as Omicron. And that's what you see there on the top left um, there. And you can also do it in the context of an extra vaccination. So three times vaccination in long-term care residents also brings you levels of neutralizing antibodies against Omicron. And Matt's gonna cut me off right away. So I'm gonna skip my last slide on heterologous challenge in hamsters. You could ask me about that later, alpha, beta, and whether or not they can uh, modulate each other's neutralizing antibodies. And I apologize for that. And thanks to a large group of people who work very hard at our, at our uh, institute. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation, uh, Dr. <coughs> Calzerano, which um, I think has really set the stage well for all of the subsequent presenters. Um, so next, uh, we'll have Dr. Finzi, who happens to be joining us from Patagonia today, um, uh, give uh, the next presentation from, from the beautiful end of the world. <laughs> You're muted still, Dr. Finzi. Okay. Sorry, thank you. I was just trying to unmute myself. I still, after two years of Zoom, I don't know how to do it. Can you see the, the, the slide? It's uh, just Hopefully loading. in full mode? Not yet. No, we see now it's full. Okay, you're all set. Okay, hopefully there's not a big delay. I mean, you need to go from Patagonia to... <laughs> to Canada. So, so well, thank you for having me. Thank you for the kind introduction and the invitation. So uh, this work I'm going to be presenting is done here at the Centre de Recherche du Chum, um, an institute of the Université de Montréal. So I just briefly want to tell you what, I mean, my expertise is HIV-1 envelope glycoproteins. And when the pandemic hit us, we thought, what can we do in the lab to help? Uh, well, glycoproteins, and they have the spike glycoprotein that we try to follow up and we try to know how we're after, uh, we didn't have vaccine at the time, how the immune system responds with antibodies to these glycoproteins. We follow the different flavors of antibodies. And we observed that we were surprised coming from the HIV field that neutralization was present right off the top immediately, but actually start to wind pretty rapidly in this cross-sectional cohort. So we build up with, um, Cécile Tremblay, Valérie Marte la Ferrière, a court in uh, Serchum to try to have a longitudinal court to try to see whether this decline in neutralization was something uh, that was observed was a, a one off because it was cross sectional. No, in, long, in a longitudinal court of healthcare worker, we observed the same decline. We work hand in hand with uh, Emma Quebec and we observed the same, uh, the same decrease in antibodies over time. And, and then we also were working with Emma Kigedek and we were able to follow up to say that in the convalescent individuals, actually the IgM seemed to play an important role in neutralization. But as Darius says, there is way more than neutralization alone. So we follow up different aspects of the immune responses over time and for a longer period of time, up to, up to eight months after uh, infection here. And we saw that, well, neutralization went down pretty rapidly, but actually, uh, and luckily for everybody, memory B cells was present. And other uh, antibody functions uh, beyond neutralization, actually, FC-mediated effector function, and we like to look into that, such as agency, was present and didn't decline as fast. And this it was, we were very lucky to, to work with uh, um, Andy McGuire and Leo Stamatatas when they make this really um, breakthrough uh, publication where they, they start to describe what is called as hybrid immunity. People who were infected then vaccinated and get this amazing level of immune responses. And actually we now know that this also translates into better protection as well. If we could learn from that to improve vaccines, is something that we would like to do. So we were keep looking on, on that. And we, we follow up with trying to understand because we have this problem in Canada and you may remember certainly in Quebec, we didn't have enough doses at the beginning to give everybody the two doses in a short frame that you would like to do in a pandemic. But we were able to show, so um, there were studies saying the vaccine efficacy against severe disease was present after one dose. Okay, and that this was confirmed, but we tried to follow what was present at the time that vaccine efficacy started to build. We didn't observe neutralization, but we did measure 
uh, um, cellular responses and also FC mediated effector functions by ADCC, ADCP, etc. So we then follow up on this long interval we got in Quebec. What, what happened with something wrong because we got this long interval at the time there wasn't there wasn't Delta or Omicron. I'm not saying that we need to wait with, for the 16 week, but uh, we just follow this immune response to see how it was. And we found that it was actually the response were very, very good. And we compared them to the short interval. And actually when Omicron came, uh, uh, came up and there was this uh, lack of neutralizing activity against Omicron, when we were doing the experiment, we saw that in our court, they still neutralize. Not as good as the ancient as the Wuhan, of course, but there was some level of neutralization, and so perhaps the interval between doses may have played a role in pro in, in, in neutralization activity and, and, and protection. And we now know that it has played some role. So this is what I like to 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 come start my presentation. Actually, here in in this paper we we, we reported we follow. It was difficult actually actually in Quebec to find people who actually got a, a short interval and that we can actually compare at the same time point. So this two court a short versus long interval is four versus 16 week, but we are comparing the time point at the exact same time point, um, three to four weeks after the second dose. And when we observe out the capacity of the elicited antibodies to recognize different VOCs, and here as an extreme VOCs, why the, this is not the VOC, it's a different virus, SARS-CoV-1, right? You can see that with the long interval, the recognition was better, but also was the neutralization activity that we look at. Pretty much everything we look at was better when you let the immune system to wait a bit longer to make these antibodies. And actually we, we made sure that these antibodies were uh, evolved a bit better and were more mature. And I come back to that. So we actually find, we kept with the same court and we look what happened when Omicron hit. And at the time we observe again, that it is true. We, we, were, look, we were observing neutralization in our court because they got this long interval. But uh, in the short interval, the neutralization was almost gone. So, and, and now there is data showing that this also translated to vaccine efficacy. But what happened after the third dose? This, the question to some extent, is this advantage of the long intervals gonna be there forever, good for us in Canada? Or can we catch up for people who receive the, the short interval? So I'd like to, to present some data that is, that is under, under review right now. Of this, uh, I have two groups naive uh, individuals and people who have been previously infected during the first wave and then has been um, vaccinated. And we are just trying to see what happened, the response comparing to the response after the second dose versus the third dose, okay? And what you can see, if you choose only look at RBD responses in the naive, which are the red here, you have this level of, of RBD antibodies that will go down in this attrition time point that we have at V4 you give the third dose and you came back to the same level that after the second dose. So yes, go and take the third dose, you are bringing it back to the level that you got after the second dose. How, how these antibodies recognize the different VOCs, including Omicron and BA.2 and BA.1.1, overall is the same story, right? You have a very good response in these uh, naive individuals, but you have this attrition and this decline, which is actually more pronounced in naive than people who got this hybrid immunity. I'm not saying to anybody to go and try to catch a virus to get hybrid immunity. Some people are not gonna make it. All I'm saying is that this hybrid immunity that we need to learn from, I only have questions, but Galit after me will have a lot of answers. If we can understand how this works, this could potentially improve vaccine design. I don't know, perhaps using mats, Matthew Miller's uh, um, uh, mucosal vaccines would be a way to hopefully uh, improve this response because there is this waning. And the, the question we have, and we are having the V6 collecting as we speak, and it looks like a yo-yo. It's gonna be stay there or it's gonna go down again. But you can certainly appreciate that the hybrid immunity, the response is more stable over time. And what about the functional aspect? And of course, I love ADCC. So here you have it. We have data, uh, and Gaudi also generated a lot of data showing the importance of FC effector functions. And you can see that height wins particularly rapidly in the naive individuals. But this, the good news, the third dose is able to bring it back. What is going to happen at V6? We should know in two weeks because we are processing those samples. But you can see the, again that the previously infected, vaccinated, the response is more stable. And this is similar response for the neutralization activity. And it is, of course, uh, it's possible that at V6, they will go down. And so, of course, we look at a bunch of VOCs. And what you see is long story short is the same thing is that the, even if you got this uh, long interval, you have a waning of the humoral responses and you need to go to get this third dose and you bring back to the same level that after the second dose. So how does it look? This all I'm showing you here is about quantity, 
What about the interaction between these different parameters that we are looking at? And you can see that, so here, between this, after the second dose, even in the attrition phase, all these parameters are pretty much well interconnected. And you bring that to the assembly level after the third dose. Something that we, we measure, and I, I cannot say that we fully understand, but in people who got this hybrid immunity, this, the association between all these parameters is way more focused. Is it because we, you, got the, you got the virus actually from the mucosa and you're, you're, you're waking up different residential T cells? I, I mean, I don't know, but this is, I wish. So first, it's not that the response is less, actually quantitatively, the response are higher, but of, they're also more focused and appears to, it doesn't appear, it's actually translate into better vaccine efficacy. So I'm gonna try to answer the last question that, that I asked, whether this advantage, that advantage to some extent that we got with this long interval remains after the third dose when we compare it to people who received the short interval. And for that, we, uh, we work in collaboration with John Wary at UPenn who got this amazing court where they get people who received it as proposed by the companies, a very short interval of uh, three weeks, and then the third dose. And here, uh, and they also have naive previously infected, and we also have naive previously infected. The difference is that here we, had, we got the 16 week period of interval. And so if you look at quantity of antibodies by looking just at RBD, regular ELISA, if you give two shots very rapidly, you boost the response immediately which is what you wanna do in the pandemic, right? But then you can see that this is a waning of, the, of these RBD antibodies over time, which is actually pretty, is, well, is uh, very pronounced. When you get only one dose, I mean, this average you have, you, it goes up. Then of course you have this attrition phase. And during this place, actually we know there was protection against severe disease. Then you give the second dose with this delay. And then you get a bit more antibodies over time. What happened after the third dose? Well, you can see that our, uh, uh, they are to similar or higher level for the short interval. But I'm not interested here into quantities. I'd like to know about quality. Of course, we are right now uh, pulling out B cells and trying to sequence the BCR to see the som somatic permutation. But something cheaper that we can do is to look at avidity. And to do that, we should do the same ELISA in parallel. But when we wash, we wash with a cryotropic agent. And here we are talking eight molar, uh, eight molar urea. And so if your antibody is still attached to the plate after eight molar urea is because it dry its target very, very much. And so we got three publications actually explaining how it goes and actually has a very, it's a, it's a surrogate of antibody maturation. And what you can see here, if you get the two dose very rapidly in blue, it will pop up rapidly, but then you hit kind of a wall and just get at that level. Of course, it's not gonna go down. The antibody, once they are mature, they are mature, but it doesn't go up. With the short, with the long interval, one dose is not able to, 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 to enhance avidity as fast as the two doses, of course not. But after the second dose, you give more time to the terminal center to do their work and actually the avidity is better. And during this difference, this is a log scale, during this difference here is when Omicron, uh, the Omicron wave hit. Okay, providing some level of, of, of antibodies response a bit better for the long interval. And what we observe here is that after the third dose, the short interval is able to catch up with the long interval. So you actually, you recover. Uh, and that's, that's what is important. What's gonna happen over time? So we're collecting, we're gonna see, but it's possible that it's gonna stay to the same level. So these were the naive individuals receiving long versus short interval. What happened with the previously infected individual who got a uh, long versus short? Well, this is the, overall the, the, um, the quantity of antibodies, but the RBD ability is something that they like. You see that people who receive uh, uh, got infected and, and then vaccinated, and independently of the, uh, of the interval, you have a very good ability, a very good maturation. So I really hope that some of this work, and as, that, as, as the field moves on, we are going to be able to, to mimic what infection does without infecting people, of course, to try to develop this hybrid immunity, which is, uh, we believe is extremely important. And Galit will talk a bit more about it. So I will stop here. I'd like to thank all the people who help us, the funding, but particularly all these healthcare workers who came every time we call them to provide blood. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Finzi. Uh, incredible work and um, lived up to the advertisement uh, of just absolutely tremendous, uh, prolific productivity over the last two years. So thank you for that. Um, I also always love 
uh, listening to and reading about anything that Drs. Finzi and Alter present because I am a big fan of FC interactions and FC dependent effector functions as well. And I'm, I'm nearly certain that we'll hear a little bit more about that in the next talk. So Dr. Alter, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, okay, so 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 following right after Andreas, um, it's always a challenge. Let me just grab that screen again. Hold on a second, um, because he always steals the thunder. But let me follow on him um, with some a little bit, couple more tantalizing observations about hybrid immunity. Um, but where my story is going to start off is really, um, you know, really um, launching off of Daryl's presentation, um, where I just want to talk through some of these variants um, that appeared over the last two years. Now, what I think that you know we saw this marvelous. Um, you know, immune profiles and protection conferred by many of the new vaccine platforms that emerged over the last two years, which was really, I think, a moment um, in vaccine history that I think we will never, ever forget, right? This is a real um, vindication and a real win for vaccinologists all around the world. Um, but I think that we all took a, a little bit of a pause in that excitement when we began to see all these variants of concern emerging um, that were, you know, slipping by neutralizing antibodies induced by vaccines quite efficiently, including the Omicron variant that, you know, really after two doses of vaccines that induce really high levels of antibodies, the virus is able to just, you know, drive transmission um, very easily in animal models as well as in human populations. But the important point I think Daryl showed nearly on his first slide was that despite the fact that we were seeing this breakthrough in neutralizing antibody activity, we did not see a concomitant breakthrough in severe disease and death in most populations. Right, and this was an incredibly important observation that did not get picked up by the media as effectively as the loss of neutralizing antibody responses against these new variants of concern. And I think on the right side, what we're seeing is really what our target immune profile was. Our you know, goal for these vaccines was to limit disease and death. And so we accomplished our goal and the vaccines do their job. The question of course, is that if it's not solely due to the induction of neutralizing antibodies, the question of course is, well, what else might be part of that immune response induced by vaccines that might help us understand at a mechanistic level how these vaccines are working so we can be a little bit smarter maybe about how we deploy boosting strategies. So focus on antibodies, of course, you know, cellular immunity is also critically important, but I'm gonna focus here on the humoral immune response. We know that beyond the ability of antibodies to simply bind and block infection to mediate neutralizing antibody activity, antibodies do, as Andreas mentioned, mediate many, many additional antiviral mechanisms through their ability to interact with nearly all immune cells that express FC receptors or are able to interact with antibodies. So these antibodies that are elicited following vaccination or infection patrol the body all over the place. Once they recognize their target, they form swarms of polyclonal immune complexes that then rapidly leverage immunity from within localized tissue compartments. And these antibodies then can deploy a wide array of different antimicrobial functions that we know are critically important to the control of other pathogens, including bacteria, parasites, as well as viruses. And these include viral clearance, elimination of infected cells, regulation of inflammation. They drive cellular um, interactions as well as um, drive T cell immune responses uh, by increasing antigen presentation. So, so we were very interested in all these other functions of antibodies. And over the last two years, we've been very active in trying to understand what's happening with these different profiles of antibodies, and can this give us hints about what might be associated with protective immunity beyond a uh, simple blockade of infection. So the first little tidbit I'm going to show you is just a, little, a couple little hints we began to capture by looking at vaccine effectiveness across the mRNA platforms. Um, so mRNA vaccines came along, they showed incredible efficacy in their phase three trials. Um, but when these vaccines um, were released uh, for public consumption, um, we began to see some differences in their performance at a population level. Now, what's important shown on the left side here was that if you look at peak immunogenicity, at Pfizer shown in the blue or Moderna induced immune responses, here just looking at RBD specific titers, the responses induced by these two mRNA vaccines is almost identical. They're not resolvable. And the same thing is true for most neutralizing antibody activity. But when we began to look at breakthrough infections across populations of individuals that received the Pfizer vaccine in the blue or the Moderna vaccine in the red, what we began to see was that there were more breakthroughs in Pfizer vaccinated individuals. So one question was, is are these vaccines really inducing different flavors of immunity, right? Because we know they're titers and their neutralizing activity is relatively similar. Is there something else going on that could explain why the Moderna platform looks a little bit better than Pfizer 
I wouldn't say a lot better, but a little bit better. Um, and so, and so we did this work. Um, Paulina did all this work. I'm going to acknowledge everyone at the very beginning with Todd and Dan Baruch. Okay. So what I'm going to show you is just really a smattering of the data, just to give you a feel for where these vaccine platforms differ. So we're going to compare Pfizer vaccine-induced immune responses to Moderna-induced in, uh, vaccine responses at peak immunogenicity. And here we're just comparing IgG1 titers to the spike antigen, so it's S. And so what you can see here um, is that there almost seems, it's not statistically significant, but that Pfizer, at least at a just pure IgG1 binding level, are inducing higher levels of antibodies compared to Moderna. So that would be contra in uh, um, contrary to what we saw in the last slide, but we'll just take a look at a little bit more at the other vaccine uh, antibody profiles. IgG2 responses, three responses, M's and A's were relatively similar across the two platforms, although we started seeing a slightly significant increase in IgA responses induced by Moderna compared to the Pfizer vaccine. vaccine. And if you look at the ability of these vaccine-induced antibodies to then interact with FC receptors that drive all those immunological functions, the response to spike antigens was identical across the two vaccine platforms. Okay, so we said, let's look at other things. Let's not look at only spike. So we also looked at the RBD specific response. So looking at the receptor binding domain, which is the primary target for uh, neutralizing antibodies. And so again, we see the IgG ones are slightly elevated in Pfizer, no difference in IgG two, threes or Ms, but again, significantly higher IgAs uh, induced to the RBD and Moderna vaccines compared to the Pfizer vaccines and their FC receptor binding profile was almost identical. We also look at the N-terminal domain. We love this domain. It is largely um, ignored in most vaccine profiling efforts, but it is a very large domain that also has been evolving in the context of variants of concern. Interestingly, for the NTD, we saw identical IgG1, 2, 3, M profiles, again, higher levels of IgAs. And very interestingly, the Moderna um, mRNA vaccine induced higher levels of functional NTD-specific antibodies compared to Pfizer-BioNTech. Okay. We also looked at S1 and S2 as just globular individual domains. And the story is always the same for these domains, especially for S1, that IgA was a really big uh, difference. So I just want to point out the major differences that we began to see is that Moderna induced higher levels of IgAs and also broadened the response um, across the um, surface of the spike antigen, really broadening functional immunity of the NTD. So this was really kind of exciting, but we look at more than just binding, we were also interested in understanding whether the functional response induced by these vaccines might differ. So we probed the ability of spike-specific antibodies to drive complement deposition, monocyte phagocytosis, neutrophil phagocytosis, or NK cell activation. And what we began to see when we started comparing these um, vaccine-induced antibodies, there's no difference in complement-fixing antibodies across the Pfizer and Moderna plat platform, no difference in monocyte phagocytic antibodies, but we did begin to see significant differences in the ability of the Moderna vaccine to leverage neutrophils, and multiple NK cell functions. And so what this told us is that there is something fundamentally different about these two vaccine platforms, whether it's associated with the longer interval, higher dose of the RNA, or the differences in the LNPs to be determined, but really shows us that this real world efficacy is associated with different flavors of humoral immunity that is induced by these platforms and might also um, help us advocate for mixing and matching even on mRNA platforms. Okay, but to kind of follow on to um, Andreas's point, we became even more excited about the fact that we began to see that in the literature, even above the you know, phenomenal immunity we're getting from these, from these mRNA platforms, that there was evidence that hybrid immunity, so the ability of, so the induction of um, in, in immunity from infection followed by mRNA vaccination, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna, was always superior at a population level to just vaccination alone. And that was true when we looked in the Delta and the Omicron wave where vaccine alone, we saw huge numbers of infections, breakthroughs. With one dose plus hybrid, you still had some protection, but you still saw lots of breakthroughs. And with two doses, it was almost impossible to break through. So we wanted to understand what it was that this you know, hybrid immunity was doing at a humoral profiling level that could maybe explain why hybrid immunity might be superior. So we took a little bit of a different angle um, than Andreas, but I think it's beautifully complementary. We again profiled lots of different features of the humoral immune response. So it's not important to read this graph. I just want to make a point here just to give you just some visual impact. So if we're looking at the immune response post the prime, so after the first dose of the mRNA, and this is in the blue individuals, every row is a different individual. Every column is a different analyte of the humoral immune response that we analyzed. And so if you look in naive individuals, 
um, after a first dose, you can see that most of the response is kind of cool, right? You saw with Andres's responses are kind of low, but in the hybrid immune people after one dose, they are much hotter, right? They're redder, they're richer in their humoral immune response across lots of different analytes that we captured. After a second dose of mRNA, here's the catch. These two groups do not look any different to me by eye. Whether you had previous infection, whether you had no infection before, or you had infection before, I don't see a visual difference in the quality of um, that vaccine induced immune response. So we set out to really begin to look at single level differences to try to understand what it was that was fundamentally different about the hybrid specific immune response that could explain why after two doses with previous infection, you do better, not because we're advocating for people to get infected, but because we think we can make next generation vaccines that can do this deliberately so we can prevent infection at a global level. So what's different? So we looked um, at individual um, antigens again, and um, this is hopefully gonna be the last data slide, so I won't overwhelm you guys, um, but we'll look at S1 specific responses, looking at just IgG1 titers. This is after the first dose in naive individuals in the blue or hybrid individuals in the red. So after a first dose, you can see clearly hybrid immunity gives you higher S1 titers, not surprising. But after a second dose, no difference between the two groups, right? So that can't explain why hybrid immunity with two doses does better than hybrid immunity with one dose or uh, two doses alone. Okay, we looked at RBD, we also looked at the S2 and we also looked at the NTD. And so if I can just draw attention to the RBD, um, again, you can see hybrid does better after one dose, after two doses, there's no difference. The same thing is true for NTD. You can see here hybrid does better with NTD after one dose, but there's no difference between the two groups after two doses. The only place we started seeing a little bit of a hint of difference is on the S2. Now the S2 is interesting because S2 is the most conserved region of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. It is a region that's conserved mostly across all variants of concern, but also across multiple beta coronaviruses. Please ask Andreas about this in the discussion to the audience. Um, but the interesting um, observation was that after second dose, the S2 response in hybrid immunity was superior in some individuals compared to that found in non-hybrid immunity. And that was the only place we began to see a trend towards difference. But we also looked at the ability of these vaccine induced antibodies, again, to interact with different FC receptors that arm the immune system to fight the virus. This is um, the oxidophagocytic receptor, inhibitory receptor, cytotoxic receptor, a neutrophil activating receptor. And interestingly, when we looked at the RBD specific response, what we began to see were hints that maybe there was a higher level of functional antibodies that was present in the individuals with hybrid immunity after a second dose compared to non-immune individuals, but this difference was not statistically significant. But it was evident across almost every FC receptor that we profiled, there was this hint about this trend in elevated functional immunity. So hybrid immunity is making those antibodies more functional even after a second dose in, um, uh, in following immunization. But what was statistically significantly elevated every single time were your S2 specific functional antibodies. So antibodies to this conserved region of the virus was um, were more capable of interacting with the opsinophagocytic FC receptor, as well as the cytotoxicity inducing receptor, suggesting that what truly might make these hybrid immunity individuals different at a humoral level is the ability to raise these antibodies to this conserved region to leverage the immune system to fight the disease. Do I have two minutes, Matt, or should I end here? I just wanna make sure. Um, yeah, and, you can have two minutes, of course. Okay, okay. I want to just show you one last thing, because I think this is really interesting. So um, Canadian vaccine. So we want to ask, are there vaccines that can do this hybrid immunity magic? And the answer is um, that we began to profile responses induced by the COVLP vaccine um, that was developed um, at Medicago by Brian Ward and Philippe Gobey, and we began to look at their responses. So I just want to show you what this vaccine is doing, which is really quite ex exciting. So, so we began to look at responses induced by um, the COVLP vaccine here in the um, reddish yellowy colors is in the presence of a adjuvant ASO3 versus the COVLP uh, uh, vaccine alone. And here looking at IgG1, 2, 3, um, M and A responses to the wild type spike um, or to the receptor binding domain S1 and S2. And the only point I want to make here is that what's fascinating about this vaccine, unlike so many others, if we look at peak immunogenicity day 42 or day 201, so six months later, we see phenomenal maintenance of binding antibodies to the spike, to the RBD, to the S1, but also to the S2. So this vaccine is maintaining these responses. Doesn't induce much twos and fours that are non-functional, but induces 
again, very strong IgG3 responses that are detectable after six months, especially to the S2 domain, which is really quite exciting. And we also see some induction of IgMs and IgAs, um, but it's really this S2 response that got us excited. So we asked, are these antibodies also functional? Very important. So we looked at the ability to induce complement deposition, monocyte phagocytosis, neutrophil phagocytosis, and NK cell activity, um, so a marker of ADCC activity. And what we found was that this vaccine, unlike many others, including the mRNA platforms, um, the use of this CoVLP with an adjuvant induces very robust monocyte phagocytic and neutrophil phagocytic antibodies, um, some of these that are really persisting, almost completely not waning over time. Um, and so this is really exciting. So we get S2 responses with function, which we haven't seen with many other platforms. Okay, so I'm gonna just leave it there. I think I, I acknowledge the people that did the work over the course of the presentation. And just to make the point that, you know, there's a lot of flavors of antibodies that we're missing by not looking a little more deeply at the humoral immune response. We see differences across the mRNA platforms that might explain real world efficacy. And we do see that there is something fundamentally different about the S2 response in hybrid immunity. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Alter. Um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Mubareka, who um, I think will sort of transition to a bit of a different flavor and, uh, and shift some of our focus to um, uh, transmission. Um, Dr. Mubareka, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Matt, and thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation. Um, so yeah, I'm a bit of an, an inflection point here, maybe to the, to the clinical side, and I will focus on transmission. Uh, and I'll start with really just uh, an overview um, in terms of what we understand and where are the gaps in our understanding are of transmission of not just SARS coronavirus 2, but also uh, the majority of, of respiratory bioaerosols and, and uh, respiratory pathogens. So not surprisingly, this is a very complex multifactorial um, process that involves the virus clearly, uh, as well as not one, but two different hosts Often they're of the same species, but not necessarily, as well as the environment. So when you think about bioaerosols, these are really particles suspended in air. Um, obviously, they're very mixed and there's a continuum of, of size and distance traveled, etc. A lot of this really depends on what the environment is like. We tend to We've tended to dichotomize this a little bit. We, we talked about droplet versus airborne. The reality is it's a continuum and it's everything in between and at both extremes, depending on the circumstances. And similarly, in terms of the actual compartments, it's the same idea. So the air and surfaces really, particles, viruses transition between the two, things can settle and then get re-aerosolized. So really, again, dichotomizing whether something is transmitted through surfaces or through the air is somewhat artificial. And I think we probably need to uh, retire some of those notions. So that's in terms of some of the more biophysical aspects of things, which I really won't talk about anymore, but we'd really like to concentrate on the viral and especially the host side of things, you know, given, given the topic today. So, you know, I think that it's pretty obvious that the virus plays a central role and different viruses obviously have different uh, predilections in terms of survival in aerosols and survival on surfaces. And even viruses like SARS coronavirus 2 are not all created equally. So we're definitely seeing differences in terms of transmission, some of which is related to how they survive in the environment. But when we think about hosts, then we're talking about fairly complex systems, because as I said before, we have two different hosts, both or each with their own biologies. And some of the key biological determinants include things like immunity. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but also other things like symptomatology um, and also behavior. So exposure, duration of exposure, how long people are exposed for, and also proximity of exposure are really, really uh, critical factors. So I'll pull on some of these threads and also um, some of the things that uh, the panelists have already mentioned um, through this case that I'd like to go over. It's um, not my patient. This was Jeff Powis's patient um, that he looked after with some, some other um, healthcare providers, and we did the virology on this case. So this is an individual living with HIV, 76 years old. Um, Past medical history was relevant, obviously, for HIV, which uh, was not treated, and his CD4 count was 110 um, at baseline. Uh, he also had coronary artery disease and, and schizophrenia, and he was admitted initially to acute care when he was um, identified as being COVID-19 uh, positive. 
positive or, or having uh, SARS coronavirus 2 during an outbreak in a transitional care setting. So he was admitted for observation. And at the time he was fairly asymptomatic. He was later discharged to a long-term care facility, but then readmitted on day 69 with fever and cough, um, still testing positive for SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, but clinically presenting more like a bacterial pneumonia and a short admission after, after being treated as such. Unfortunately, he was readmitted, um, this time with a hip fracture requiring surgery, complicated by aspiration pneumonia, which was also managed. But unfortunately, he really didn't recover from this episode and, and um, ultimately passed away in palliative care. And as you can see here, he really continued to test positive for SARS coronavirus 2 for over 140 days. Um, so we were involved because of some questions around infection control. And, the, and, you know, just as a reminder, he was in a congregate care setting through this whole time. So the fact that he was testing positive with a CT value of around 20, sometimes less, sometimes more, suggested that he may actually be shedding infectious virus. So indeed, that's what we found when we did viral culture on his nasal pharyngeal swabs. The other thing that uh, we also did was we did whole genome sequencing. Um, we, we, did, we sequenced the virus five times between days zero and 100, just to look and see whether or not that there were any fixed mutations had evolved, because certainly this has been described before. And in his case, we really didn't find anything in that regard. And you have to wonder if it also is because we also didn't find any antibodies, um, neither to S nor to N uh, on the two occasions that we looked. So even out to you know day 130, he really didn't mount an antibody response. And that's with clearly having had SARS coronavirus too, no, no question. And also um, maybe um, uh, this may come and reflect what Dr. Finzi's findings have been you know, he did receive two, two doses of mRNA vaccine uh, separated by four weeks. Uh, the second dose was about three months prior to his initial presentation. So despite that, he really never mounted an antibody response. So in his, this particular case, we didn't do any environmental sampling. So it's really hard to say whether or not he would have been transmitting to other individuals through the aerosol route. But I think the fact that he was shedding uh, SARS coronavirus too in the air, uh, sorry, in his um, respiratory tract um, certainly suggests that that's a possibility. Now we have looked in other uh, patients. So this is a, a separate study that we did at, uh, to see whether or not patients in acute care were contaminating their environments with uh, SARS coronavirus too. Now these are not necessarily HIV infected individuals. These are all comers who were admitted and clearly um, they were in fact, or they were contaminating their environments, at least with viral RNA, um, and fairly broadly as well. Obviously, we tested a, a wide range of areas within their rooms. So again, these are hospitalized patients. Um, and about half of them shed at least some RNA onto a, at least a single surface uh, in their rooms throughout their admission. But only three yielded infectious virus, and that's with a fairly sizable um, sample size. And if you look at who among them actually had infectious virus um, uh, isolated from their surfaces, it really tended to be patients that were hypoxic, uh, so needing oxygen, uh, patients that had higher concentrations of viral RNA, so CT values of less than um, 30, people who had comorbidities, and people whose um, sample uh, date was collected within seven days of symptom onset. And when you actually sequence these viruses, not surprisingly, what you find in the environment is almost identical to what you find in their, in their upper respiratory tract. Interestingly, all we found was really RNA dust in the air, um, and none of the few air samples that were positive actually had infectious virus. And following on from that work, we also wanted to look in the acute care setting at how much virus actually gets dispersed specifically in the critical care setting. So for this, we, we kind of dusted off this mannequin that we affectionately called Quarantino, who's in desperate need of a facial here, um, and used phage to see whether or not different uh, oxygen administration modalities would change how much virus actually gets dispersed, because clearly we are not going to do this with uh, SARS coronavirus too. 
So we did this in a simulated ICU uh, room and sort of positioned the samplers around where we thought healthcare workers would be uh, most likely exposed um, and showed that really with, with um, some of the non-invasive uh, positive pressure um, modalities where you would sort of expect a lot of virus to be dispersed, it really was no more than something like nasal prongs. So that's what comp patients commonly come in with or are, are given uh, oxygen through. Um, and not surprisingly, patients who are on a ventilator or, or have a, a, a one of these helmets on, which we didn't use very commonly, uh, I admit, but certainly wanted to test. Um, because of the closed circuit and the valves and the seals, you really don't see a lot of viral dispersion. The reason this is important is because so many patients were being um, managed with high flow nasal oxygen. And it was particularly important for this setting because when patients were being transported in the pre-hospital setting, and in this particular case, this is actually an air ambulance. So this is a fixed wing air ambulance. Um, you know, the preference is to use high flow nasal oxygen rather than have to, have to intubate patients. And this is particularly important in rural and, and more remote areas where uh, the preference is to use high flow nasal oxygen and where patients might need to be flown into tertiary care centers for care. And when we repeat this with um, the study with just saline, same thing, high flow nasal oxygen really doesn't disperse particles any more than just a nasal prongs. So going back to the, to the patient that I mentioned before, I mean, clearly he was at risk of transmitting more to other patients than one would necessarily expect the fact that he really shed for, you know, well over 100 days, you know, up to 140 days, most likely. Infectious virus has clear implications for infection control because that's way beyond the period of time you would isolate a patient. What we didn't find, which others have described, um, is really cha significant changes in the viral genome. Now, this particular case, which is probably the one that's been most well characterized, um, showed this without question. Now, what's interesting about this particular case is this individual did mount uh, antibody response to their SARS coronavirus uh, 2 infection. So one has to wonder what's actually driving some of these changes sometimes. The other major question that stands out is also with respect to individuals living with HIV and the determinants of transmission to them. We really don't know what the key characteristics and determinants are for um, not necessarily exposure, but actual transmission and susceptibility to infection with respect to uh, bioaerosol exposure. So some of the things that you know, we really stand to, to gain from understanding is how much you know, their HIV status and potentially co-infections with things like mycobacterium tuberculosis could potentially play a role in transmission. So really just to wrap this up, there is such a, I mean, I just showed you one potential transmission risk scenario. There are many, many, many potential risk scenarios, more than we could, we could really describe. And I think the real challenge here is to try and understand how we can implement mitigation measures that are both effective and feasible. Um, and clearly, you know, this, this really requires a multidisciplinary approach given the complexity of, of transmission. So thank you to everyone who helped with this work and I'll now pass it over uh, to Cecile. Thank you so much, Dr. Mubareka. And yes, now uh, last, but certainly not least, um, we will have Dr. Tremblay round out uh, the session and, and provide some I think um, overview of thoughts uh, as well as um, some contextualization with her own work around the impacts of, of COVID in the context of HIV. Dr. Tremblay, the floor is all yours. Um, so um, I, I will be short because I would like to leave a few minutes for questions. Uh, and I will uh, follow up on what Samira just uh, told us about what are the determinants of um, outcomes in HIV infected patients and SARS-CoV-2? Because that's been a question mark since the beginning of the second pandemic, the first one being HIV. And we've all 
wondered whether HIV status affected um, not only the course of the disease, but the immune response to vaccine. And there have been several studies, which I will not show you uh, right now because you've all seen the results uh, at various conferences, but they don't all go in the same direction, but most of them um, say that there is a worse outcome of SARS-CoV-2 in um, HIV-infected individuals. The large populational studies, such as those conducted in South Africa or in UK or in Scotland, clearly show an excess risk of uh, worst outcomes for HIV-infected people. But of course, these large populational studies do not control for comorbidities and other variables that could affect um, the immune response to, to any disease. But some other studies have also shown that there is an excess risk of worst outcomes. And um, some of them, of course, associate the CD4 count as a, a major um, risk factors, but it hasn't been unanimous on every study. Some studies um, have not shown a difference between uh, of outcomes between HIV infected an HIV uninfected individual. Of course, you need to take into consideration, and as a clinician, that's my take on correlates of immune protection, like people living with HIV are people. So the age, like all of us, the majority of people living with HIV in Canada is over 50 years of age. Uh, they have more and more comorbidities lung disease, cardiac disease, all of these uh, can affect the course of, uh, of the infection and can affect the quality of the immune response. So whenever we do these studies, it is very important that we take these into account and also the social environment in which our uh, people are living will affect not only the risk of transmission as uh, Samira just uh, showed us, but it can affect the, um, the, the, the quality of health in general of these individuals and the access to healthcare, access to rapid healthcare if you get infected, and then eventually if you don't have these access, um, uh, worse outcomes. So this is, as an infectious disease, SARS-CoV-2 is a, a disease that will affect people with lower socioeconomic conditions worse than the, the rest of the population. As it relates to um, response to vaccine, so as we were setting up this uh, uh, huge set of cohorts at the CHUM with Andres and Valérie martel Laferriere and, and Claude and other people and Daniel Kaufman and Madeleine Durand, uh, we decided that we wanted to study specifically um, the immunity of uh, people living with HIV and uh, having contracted uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also their response to vaccination. And I'm just going to show you a few preliminary results because um, these results will are, are have been accepted in vaccine. They will be pu published very shortly. They're on bioarchive. And what we saw in our cohort is that people with lower CD4 count, below 250, had much less um, strong anti-RBD uh, responses than people in the higher stratum of, um, of, uh, of CD4 counts. Now, I know this is the response after one dose. Now, we're gonna, I'm not going to be presenting you in detail the rest because it hasn't been, uh, we, we still need to finalize the analyses. But there was also a correlate of um, immunogenicity with the age of our patient, the younger, of course, having more immunogenicity than the, the older pe people. Now, I know that not all groups have found the same results. Um, another Canadian group, uh, um, which I uh, collaborate with, did not find necessarily the same um, correlation with CD4 count. But again, we need to look at the populations. How are they different? How many people were with low CD4 count? How low was it? What was the nadir CD4 count, et cetera? So there are a lot of the factors that can affect what you're going to find in um, in this type of studies. So we are uh, continuing the study with Andres uh, and uh, they're working in all of this fabulous work uh, 
his lab has been doing in the last few months, and we are going to characterize in depth the uh, vaccine responses in these uh, HIV infected, uh, H yeah, HIV infected and uh, vaccinated people with or without uh, infection with uh, COVID-19 as well, so that we can see if we if these people generate hybrid immunity, the same as the general population. So I'm going to stop there because uh, the, the time is running and I would definitely like to have so you have time for you guys to, to um, ask your questions and for the panel to, to be able to answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Tremblay. Um, the the um, question in the question window so far relates to um, hybrid immunity versus vaccine doses. So um, just uh, just give me a nod. I think anyone could probably feel this, but, but certainly maybe um, Galita or Andres. Uh, the question was, do you think that four vaccine doses will be equivalent to uh, what we currently see with hybrid immunity? I think Andreas should take this one. I mean, I mean, it's, uh, it's not what we believe, it's going to be what we measure. Uh, something that I just, when I was presenting, I got an email with the data of the V6. And what we are seeing is that the decline in titers and this is four months after the third dose, is not as strong that we saw after the second dose. So it could be that this decline is, is, is slowing down, but we need to measure everything. And so it will take some time. And um, I think that the mucosal um, route of antigen presentation happening with the real virus may could make some differences and potentially at some time a boost with the mucosal uh, vaccine may be needed to kind of create that. And also, I fully agree with Galit, and I pass that along to her, that S2 response is extremely important. And clearly, from all the BNAPs, that we, BNAPs all the antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 that we found out, the, the really BNAPs that we found out are against S2. And so far, there is one that so far is able to hit all VOCs. So hopefully, we are going to be able to maintain that. But we do see differences in the dissertation of these antibodies between vaccinates versus infected individuals. So somehow, the, the, the vaccine is not presenting the spike in the exact same confirmation. It is working, yeah, maybe, but it's not the I, same. Yeah, maybe I can add, Andre. So um, just to be a little bit contradictory, because it's fun to argue with you. Um, but uh, you know, the data out of Israel with the fourth shot does not suggest that it's matching hybrid immunity. So I think that the um, real world data, I think in the end will trump, you know, all these speculations and the real world data would suggest that at least, um, you know, you get a transient window of, you know, real transmission blocking activity, but it is short lived. And so there is something fundamentally missing from this vaccine strategy that we currently have in our toolkit. And so adding this additional component, which may be mucosal immunity and Matt, maybe you need to answer this question. Um, you might know the answer better than all of us, but maybe adding that mucosal inflammatory priming. Maybe there is something really magical about that. And thinking about how that works is going to be important. I think the one thing I want to mention, though, in the Swedish study that I showed, um, that epi study, um, they suggest in that data that it doesn't matter if you prime or if you boost with infection. But just having some sort of mucosal antigen exposure with the virus seems to do something very important. And so maybe you can speak to what that magic is, but um, but I think that that's what the real world data would suggest is that just a fourth boost is not gonna solve all of our problems. Great, yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Alter and Dr. Finzi. I agree that um, uh, certainly there are unique qualities of the immune response that are stimulated upon mucosal exposure. Um, uh, you know, Dr. Alter presented really interesting data regarding Moderna and IgA, obviously the, the nature of local IgA responses due to um, in situ antibody production uh, is very different from what we tend to measure in the periphery. There's also trained innate immunity as an example, which we know can be stimulated by, by viral infection in the lungs. So yeah, we'll be, uh, um, certainly I think there are, there are differences that we might expect. Um, we have a minute left uh, and there is one more question in the window from Dr. Folk who um, is asking, whether pre-existing immunity to seasonal coronaviruses um, uh, does something similar to the hybrid immunity that we see uh, for individuals who've been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, 
I mean, what we measure, if I can jump in before Gadget, I'm sure she wants to answer, is that vaccine responses are um, a, a, a good pre-existing immunity is actually a, a predictive of a very good vaccine responses. We and others have measured that. I, I would have a pragmatic answer to that. Uh, we've all had colds all our lives and nobody's, and they didn't survive the SARS-CoV-2, people died. So I, I, I just want to um, add a little bemol. Um, what's a B minor? I don't know what's in, in, in English. It's um, that all of this that we're seeing in, in, uh, in the lab in, on hybrid immunity and protection, let's remember that we see patients all the time who've had, had COVID and then they get it a second time. And of course, we want to look at the severity of disease and everything, but we need to be careful in how we uh, qualify this, uh, the, the, this uh, immunity uh, uh, in terms of, uh, is it really protective? And if I had a, another question I would like to throw out at Gellit is, is, uh, is um, uh, are there, if we were to construct a vaccine, uh, a universal vaccine that targets some conserved region of SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV or coronavirus, uh, would there be any other areas you would think we should look at? Uh, okay. Hey, can I just say, hi, Keith, that's a great question. Question um, and then to answer Cecile and to um, address Andreas's just point. Um, so absolutely. So I think Cecile, there is data from um, Manisha Gar that was published in JCI that suggests that people who had pre-existing high levels of both nucleocapsid and S2 specific cross-reactive immunity were less likely to get COVID-19 severe disease and natural infection. So I think it points to the importance of nucleocapsid and how nucleocapsid immunity works, of course, through T cells, maybe even through antibodies and clearing immune complexes is very important. Um, and, and, and then I, but I have to say the one thing, the good news, right, Keith, is that um, I don't see any evidence, at least in my hands, of original antigenic sin having an impact on vaccine induced immune responses. So that I think is the good news. Um, but I, I do think there might be some cross cove protection due to S2 and nucleocapsid. And maybe that teaches us how we can make better vaccines for the future. Great, thank you so much. Um, I've been told by the organizers that the Zoom meeting will not close. Uh, and there are a couple of more questions. So if our panelists uh, will will be willing to entertain one or two more questions. Uh, I'll pose them. Um, some of these are very quick. So um, the next question I think dovetails a little bit on on the issue of uh, conserved epitopes and how those might be um, used to generate a, a pan coronavirus or a pan sarbecovirus vaccine. Um, and the question is whether or not mRNA. Uh, am I reading this right? Well, I guess the question is whether or not current COVID vaccines in general generate uh, central memory T cells in addition to uh, humoral immune responses? Anybody want to take the T cell question? Dr. Alter, go ahead. I mean, I, I, can, I can speak to other people's work. I, I probably should speak my own, and maybe Matt and Andreas, you guys can speak to it as well. But I, I think that the data suggests that you do get very nice um, T cell immune responses, particularly CD4 responses with the mRNA vaccines, and they are durable, very durable. Um, so memory is established at long levels. The adenoviruses platform seem to induce CD8 T cells as well. And I think that that's one of the reasons we think that the J&J &J vaccine, even with one shot, you know, really did seem to lead to some level of cross coronavirus or cross VOC protection. Um, and then I, and, and so I think that those data are very encouraging. I think that there are potentially efforts that we can make to try to boost those CD8 T cell responses and CD4 responses. Um, and to, you know, again, drive them to localize in as tissue resident memory as, um, uh, Andreas mentioned, because I think the big issue, right, is that once they're programmed as memory, they're floating around, we have to recruit them back to the lung, they've got to proliferate, they've got to activate so they can kill, um, and that takes too long. So we need them at the site where they can act immediately. And that's, I think, a big goal for the future. Thank you. Um, Dr. Alter's presentation clearly got the audience excited about uh, CoVLP, and there's a question about um, whether it will be available in Canada soon. Um, I can maybe speak to that as uh, as someone who sits on NASI. Um, obviously, CoVLP has been approved. Um, I think the the issue is I, I don't know about um, explicit supply, but the indication for CoVLP is fairly limited because 
um, at least at the federal level, um, the preferential recommendation is still for mRNA vaccines. And so um, that could change, of course. Uh, people who would get COVID-LP at this point would mostly be people for whom the mRNA vaccines are contraindicated, I think. Um, That's so. silly. <laughs> They, yeah. they should make that the boost. I think that is a really cool, um, that's a, that's a, that's a great vaccine. Yeah, I, I, I agree that, uh, it, all, all the more, um, variety and options we have, the, the better in this case. Isn't there an ongoing study of, um, COVID-LP as a booster? Um, so we would have these results, uh, short, in a short period of time, and that could be, um, very interesting. Yes, yes, exactly. I think as the evidence continues to evolve, so will the, the recommendations for, for sure. Um, I have one last question that, that's a burning question related to FC effector functions that I'm going to take privileges host to ask. Um, and it's tying things back into HIV. So um, either uh, uh, Dr. Finzi or Dr. Alter, both, I'm wondering, is there any data regarding how either well-controlled HIV in the context of, of individuals who are treated or in, in contrast, individuals who have poorly controlled HIV um, impact on their ability to make um, FC activating antibodies? So, I mean, obviously one could anticipate differences in total antibody titers. I'm thinking more about Glycoforms, though, is there is there an impact on H, of HIV on the on the glycoform profile or um, isotype biases that might impact their ability to make FC activating antibodies? Let me jump before Gadi talks about all these different uh, glycoform. Is there is a fundamental difference between SARS-CoV-2 and HIV, and is the fact and on HIV, these antibodies with very strong fc mediated effector function are unable to see the closed trimer, which is present at the surface of cell. Where in SARS-CoV-2, these virus, I mean, can have hundreds of them that don't neutralize, but they're able to mediate fc mediated effector function. But truly, and I think that Galit led the field related to the different glycosylation profiles of the FC portion of these antibodies. So I will let her uh, answer that part. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Andresa completely. So, and Matt, the, the answer to your question is that HIV um, changes all of the above. It changes subclass profiles. It pushes them to IgG4s that are not functional. It pushes the response towards uh, anti-inflammatory or like not functional antibody FC glycans. And the reason is because you have this chronic antigen exposure, right? You have so much antigen in the system that's constantly driving the B cells completely crazy. And so like T cells that, you know, go to exhaustion by upregulating PD-1 and CTLA-4 and all these, all these other things, antibodies do it also, right? By basically moving towards less inflammatory subclass FC profiles, right? Because you want to stop the pathology, you want to stop the, um, the, you know, the inflammation induced by those immune complexes. And so the B cells are doing this as kind of a reaction to having too much antigen in the system. So we've known this for a long time. And we see in people who spontaneously control the virus, they pick the right flavors and they keep those antibodies going that are probably working with the T cells to keep everything in line. Now, I think there are a lot of lessons there for when we think about making vaccines also for SARS-CoV-2, since this is a kind of a hybrid session, you know, HIV has led the field Field, right, immunologically, I, I know influenza too. I don't want to give you guys. Thank not you. Credit, but, but there's also been like a lot from HIV that we learned, right? That is really important, and and so I think that learning from you know boosting too often is almost like having a chronic exposure to antigen. That's not a good thing, right? And so we have to think about this, you know, really carefully because that lesson from HIV that you have to hit the right epitopes with the right specificity, with the right functions, you've got to get those vaccines to really train the immune system in the right way. And we're doing this now across lots of pathogens and hopefully this second pandemic where we've all come together, right? From flu and HIV and RSV and every other pathogen, we can now start to really use those learnings to make better vaccines for future pandemics on what I think was a, a fantastic note to end um, this session on uh, regarding the, the benefits of, you know, combining expertise from a variety of fields uh, in order to address these major, um, you know, pressing and, and um, uh, you know, I guess these public health threats that aren't leaving us anytime soon. It's, you know, the end of the day, I need a drink, I guess. <laughs> My words are not coming to me, but thank you all uh, so much uh, in the audience.
for joining us today. And of course, a special thanks to uh, our incredible panel for their uh, presentations and thoughts. Um, it's been a real privilege to moderate this session. Um, and uh, I hope to be able to see all of you uh, in the audience uh, and, and especially uh, my good friends on the panel um, very soon. So, so thank you all uh, very, very much. It's been great. Good, really, really good job, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night and a great weekend, everyone.